All right. Okay, very good. So as the screen says, this is effective field theory day. Um, I remind you that the there's a free copy of Dynamics of the Standard Model waiting for everybody. The links are on various pages or pages. Um, it's open access, so it doesn't cost anything. And But it's particularly relevant for today's lecture because I pull various things out of that um, as my the way I frame it. There's also, if anyone is brave enough, there's a six-hour lecture series at Perimeter on effective field theory that I gave. But we should be able to just do what's sufficient today. So basically, I'm going to do effective field theory via two examples. Where we get to see the basic properties. And then the third example will be gravity, of course. So the, the first one is going to be QED with a heavy particle, a heavy fermion. That's, that's called we'll call it the top um and here you're the lagrange and the qed lagrange and that we start with is minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu and then psi bar i d slash minus m psi where that's the heavy mass there. And the correspondence that we're going to be after is that the path integral that we have here, we start off with d a. We're integrating over a, d psi, d psi bar, e to the i, integral d4x, LQED. That's a function of A and psi. And we're going to integrate out the heavy particle because it's heavy, and so we're living at low energies. The top quark doesn't influence atomic physics. So we're going to then write this as dA. There's no more top quark around. E to the I integral d or x l effective, some effective Lagrangian that's only a function of a because the top quark's gone. And we'll label this thing, just put a little symbol on it, lambdas and top, meaning that this is only to be applied for values energies below the top mass. So there's some cutoff. And we have an, the answer is going to be the effective Lagrangian is minus a quarter F mu nu, the same thing. And then the, it's minus E squared over 240 I squared M top squared F mu nu box F mu nu. So there's the effect of Lagrangian that we'll get out. And so the process of doing that gives us a few, few lessons about effective field theories. And the second example is, is more interesting, more complicated. It's going to be the linear sigma model. Here, the Lagrangian is one half d mu sigma, sigma squared plus one half d mu phi, d mu phi, so vector field, so massless particles with a symmetry which is involves sigma squared plus phi squared. The Lagrangian is mu squared over two and minus lambda over four sigma squared plus pi squared, phi squared squared. 
Okay, so this is this is basically the Higgs sector of the standard model. So you've all seen it before. The spontaneous symmetry breaking with the expectation value of sigma is V is square root of mu squared for lambda. And here the correspondence will be we start out uh, the path integral is going to be the integral over t sigma t phi in principle over all energies e to the i um, integral d four x l of sigma and phi overall energies. And that's going to be equal to the integral over some different fields that are now called pi, e to the i integral d 4x L effective. So again, effect, effective x. It's only a function of pi. Is there a question? Okay. No, I think it was only. It was just a random noise. Okay. Yeah. I thought. Okay, and here we'll put the the idea that this is um, valid up to the mass of the sigma or something. So we've integrated out the heavy particle. So we know there's a heavy particle there, the sigma. It's like the Higgs. It's integrated out. They're the Goldstone bosons, which are the pions. But here, the the interesting feature is. Is that it has a very different form. The effect of the Grunchen is v squared over four trace e mu u e mu u dagger plus some l one trace d mu u d mu u dagger quantity squared, and there'll be another piece which I'll tell. L2, something else there with L1 equals something. I'll tell you what they are. L2 equals something, but with particular numbers. So we have this V, which we have already seen, but L1 and L2 are going to be some particular numbers. And U is going to be the exponential I tau dot pi over V. Okay, with tau is the Pauli matrices. Okay, so here, here there's something interesting happened that the fields that we started with aren't even there anymore. There's some related fields, but they're different. Um, and we have a nonlinear interaction, non-renormalizable. We'll renormalize it and all that, those things. So these are the two examples. Um, let's do the QED example. Okay, the obviously the piece that we're interested in is we're integrating out the heavy top quark. So we're interested in the diagram where the photon couples up to heavy top quarks. And I'll snip it, it's down here. The, the well, I got more than I wanted, but um Let's just do that again.
right, there I got what I wanted. Um, except that I missed the, the function pi there. So this is the vacuum polarization function. And we know that the this basically ends up changing the propagator from E squared over Q squared to E squared over Q squared one plus pi of Q squared. So this is the familiar vacuum polarization function. Um, but there's, there's some features associated with it. We, everyone focuses on the divergence, which is of course there. Um, and we know that gets renormalized away. What is actually more interesting and perhaps more disturbing is the log m squared. That's the mass of, in this case, the top quark. And so in the process of renormalization, it, it sort of looks like the QED depends on depends on the top quark mass. Okay. Um, and in, in practice, that's true. I mean, the, the, if you had some bare coupling and you renormalize it, you'll, depending on what the value of the top quark mass is, you'll end up with a different answer. Um, the divergences, of course, maybe they're not there. Maybe there's a finite theory in the end, so you don't have to worry about that. But we know that there's the top quark there, and so the mass of the top quark is interesting feature here. And you may be other heavy quarks, which we don't know about yet. How can QED depend on that? But of course, the process of renormalization is really a process of measurement. And the what we call e squared over four pi is one over 130, measured to be 137 at low energies is e zero squared over four pi one plus pi evaluated near zero. And once you express things in terms of this, then mt disappears. The only residual is the Q squared over mt squared effect that you see right there. So the, the, the one over epsilon disappears, the log m squared disappears, and you're left with this suppressed one over top quark thing. This is the applequist carazone theorem. that the effects of heavy physics appears in renormalized parameters and suppressed effects. by powers of the heavy scale. And so this is this theorem is built into EFT logic that heavy stuff appears local because of the uncertainty principle.
and and it appears that in, in either constants in the, in a local Lagrangian. Okay, and in fact, this is really why quantum mechanics works. Um, if 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 this weren't true, then we would have to know the physics at arbitrary high energies to make predictions at low energies. But in practice, all that un unknown physics at high energies ends up as parameters in a local Lagrangian, which we go out and measure and um, can use at low energies. And the the pe feature that we're going to do here, well, actually, so let's let's then go back to the effect of Lagrangian that. I showed above the the effect of those extra powers of q squared can be written as an effective interaction between two photons with a power of q squared over the the heavy mass squared with some coefficient which I've chosen to match exactly onto the coefficient of right there the five times the fifteen pi m squared in the denominator. Um, okay, and the the features that we use here is is that this expansion in powers if I have integral d four q over two pi to the fourth q squared e to the i q dot x. This goes like derivatives on a delta function of x. Because if I can pull q squared out by writing it as a derivative, I then um, can get a delta function. So our terms in a, in a amplitude are equivalent to local terms in a an expansion but there are also there can be non-local effects if i take this something that we saw on monday log of q squared e to the i q dot x. That's some function L of x, which is not 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 strictly local. Okay. I, and that would happen if the mass were negligible, the you would then get the logarithms. So if you have light fields, you get logarithms, you get heavy fields, you get powers. And the physics differences between local terms and non-local terms. Okay. So that's that's the basically the if what I want to talk about here. This is what I would call EFT 1.0. Basically. This is the type of thing that you see when you see effective field theories often um, as local effective Lagrangians. Okay. But effective th field theory is actually more than that. That's that's the very simplest of possible examples. Those those features are true, but we need to do better. And so this next example, the the linear sigma model, um, 
um, sorry, sorry, can I interrupt you a second yes, you and can, ask, ask a question? Like, um, I wanted to ask, what does locality have to do with the uncertainty principle? Maybe it's a um, okay. yeah, silly okay. question. Yeah. But... Great, it's a, it's a perfect question. Okay, so basically, the, the uncertainty principle tells us that if we have a very large energy difference or momentum difference delta x those go like h bar so that if if we're at low energies and exciting a very heavy particle that only happens for a short period of time or a short distance so the the effect of heavy stuff looks local when viewed at, at low energies okay now i see yeah okay thank and you so, yeah so that's that's the crucial thing mathematically it, it is the the feature that i said here that the heavy stuff can be taylor expanded in powers of the momentum um and each term in that taylor expansion looks like the derivative of a delta function the light stuff Logs can't be Taylor expanded in powers of the momentum. The log can't, is is can't Taylor expand around Q squared equals to zero. Those things then can't be expressed as local stuff. And so the mathematics is this: the uncertainty principle gives you the sort of physicsy picture. Okay, great. Thank great. you. Great. Well, thanks for the question. Okay, so in the linear sigma model, um, the usual notation the way we normally see this is we define that sigma is a the um, vacuum expectation value plus a fluctuation around that, that value. And the Lagrangian then describes a massive signal field. So I'm not going to write out all the terms here. Um, and the, But the interaction pieces have the following form. So it's lambda. So I expand around that V. Sigma twiddle, sigma twiddle squared plus phi squared. So minus lambda over four. Sigma twiddle squared plus phi squared squared. So there's some triple couplings and the usual quarter couplings left over plus massive fields. Um, the the feature that is relevant for what I'm about to do is that these have no derivatives. That they're just polynomial terms in the coupling. Um, I'm going to write out using some better notation. So B, better notation. Um, The I'm going to let sigma capital sigma equals sigma plus i tau dot pi tau is the poly matrices uh, tau dot phi I'm sorry it's still the same old phi then trace of sigma sigma dagger is then two sigma squared plus pi squared, phi squared. It's just the usual pieces that we have. And in this notation, I can write the Lagrangian is one quarter trace d mu sigma, d mu sigma dagger plus mu squared over two, over four, sorry. 
trace, sigma, sigma dagger, minus lambda over 16, trace, sigma, sigma dagger squared. Trace the square. Okay, so I haven't really done anything. I've just renamed the fields. the The beauty of this one is that it it's an intermediate step to where I want to get, but it also shows the symmetry. Well, symmetry of the theory, which may have not been obvious, is if sigma gets transformed to some transformed values where, where L and R are issue two matrices. So you can see the symmetry because sigma sigma dagger is symmetric and these are just um, constant matrices so they commute through derivatives. And yeah, the symmetry is obvious there. Um, that, however, is just an intermediate step. Well, the thing I'd like to arrive at is what I call the best notation. And that's, I'm gonna now write sigma is V plus S E to the I no, let's let's actually let's introduce here u with u is e to the i tau dot pi over v. Okay, so this is a nonlinear transformation. V plus s um, is you know, to some extent, S looks sort of like the sigma field because it's sort of like the V plus sigma, except that it's mixed up with this pion field. So these are redef field redefinitions. And the, let me write out the full Lagrangian without any approximation. Okay, so it's one half V mu S squared minus m sigma squared s squared so the massive field there's a v plus s over four squared trace d mu u d mu u dagger and then there's interactions that look like minus lambda v s cubed minus lambda over four s to the fourth. Okay. So what have we got there? Well now this this is starting to look uh crazy in a way. The S interactions are pretty normal. They are just usual interactions, cubic and quartic interactions of a massive field. But the pi interactions now have this um, nonlinear form. And so this looks non-renormalizable at this stage. However, it is without any approximation, this the same thing as the original theory I started with. So it's without any approximation, it's just renaming the fields the exact same as, as I started with. So this is no approximation. And to check that, you, you what's up? The, the fact that this is the same is also known as Hogg's theorem. Um, names don't matter. Okay, and the uh, formal version of this basically also requires that the fields 
have the same kinetic energies. So S is sigma twiddle plus dot, dot, dot. Pi is phi plus dot, dot, dot. And the kinetic energies are the same. Just so, and that that happens if you just expand this term, you get the kinetic energies for the pions. The, they match the kinetic energies for the phi fields. And you can check in DSM. I go through the um, process of checking that I, I ex exchange sigmas. I do you know pi pi five pi scattering. Um, this, in, in the original field basis, each of these is of order one because there's, they're none, no poly, no derivatives in the interaction. So this is one, you get minus one plus e squared plus e to the fourth. Um, there's a hidden cancellation that you can't see ahead of time. The terms that independent of the energies disappear and you get energy dependent scattering. So this is names A and names C. You just have this piece at lowest order um, because I, I work here and this starts off then at order E squared. And if I do this, that's a order e to the fourth. Okay, so there's the correspondence. You, but basically, you can work out any amplitude, any amplitude at all that you want can be worked out, and they're going to be equivalent in these two theories. But now I can do the effective field theory. I do this by integrating out the heavy field. And you can sort of see what happens. The only thing that sits around here at the stage is this for the light fields, all are contained in this trace d mu u d mu u dagger. The first term there is the v squared over four. I drop the s. So I get a piece that looks like this, a leading order. And then I will get terms that look like s exchange. And then the, eventually there'll be terms that look like s loops, which I'll come back to. But at this stage, you can see this term right here is easy to write down. This is, so this is going to be my L effective. This is V squared over four trace D mu U, D mu U dagger. That's gotten from right there, right there. The piece where I coupled up to a power of S is comes from the expansion of the that interaction there also involves this so each of these vertices here is trace d mu u d mu u dagger so the next term turns into v squared over eight m sigma squared trace d mu u u dagger quantity squared. Um, at this stage, I've replaced the propagator one over q squared minus m sigma squared by just minus one over m sigma squared because I, I'm doing an energy expansion and q squared is small. So I just get a local term. So again, I get local.
and um all right so that's that's that step there but the point of doing this example was to um show that the effective field theory is a full quantum field theory. So it's been a useful construction here because I've constructed a non-trivial effective field theory in front of your eyes just by doing field redefinitions. But now this part is a little bit um, trickier to explain. And so let's go back. So in this second example here, um, I said that the path integral over sigma and phi is gives you the same results as the path integral over just field phi, but with this effective Lagrangian. And now that starts to be almost looking problematic. I have the effective Lagrangian. The effective Lagrangian is this non non renormalizable type. And um, so you might worry about doing loops, but I have to do loops of these pi m fields. Um, so how can this work out? We're going to do it by pictures, and then I'll show you formulas after this. But basically, remember that in the original basis, we had this the the phi to the fourth interaction plus. The phi to the fourth interaction with lambdas and the one with the sigma exchange turned into the effective interaction with this effective Lagrangian. at low energies. And so then if I do loops in the full theory, let's look at the following loops. So I have a loop here where now I'm, I'm only gonna take my external fields to be light fields, but internally here, I'm going to need sigmas and um, phi's. And I'll have a bunch of diagrams. Okay, so let's here's here's a set of loop diagrams in the full theory that would be involved in some scattering process. The, the loop diagrams in the effective field theory would only involve sorry, let's clean that up. the diagram that looks like phi, phi, only phi is here. I mean, or pi is actually, pi is in the effective theory, pi, pi, 
pi, pi, pi, pi. And they have the effective vertex here. Okay, so what I'm wanting you to, to try to picture is how these at low energies are going to be the same. The low energy parts of these loops are going to be the same. And you can see that by taking these two guys here and replacing it by L effective. Okay, so um, here's one vertex. Here's the other. So those are the two vertices that become L effective at, at this other side here. So this side was that one um, become L effective. This side plus that one become L effective. And then this guy squared becomes that box. So basically at low energies, the these four terms is the square of those two terms. And so you can see that at very low energies, these are the same at low loop energies. At high energies, they're different, of course. At high energies, the sigma propagators here produce suppressions. It's a renormalizable field theory. These, this other one is a non-renormalizable field theory that has extra divergences at high energies. Okay, so from our work on these scattering amplitudes, we, we can see that the low energy results in the loop integral are the same, high energies are different. And, but now we invoke the uncertainty principle, the high energy things look like a local Lagrangian. And so there's some local Lagrangian that can be used to correct the difference. So if we do the loops in the effective theory and use a local Lagrangian, we can get exactly the same result as doing it in the full theory. Okay, now to see that actually, that's that sounds great. To see it work in practice is, is um a bit is well it's interesting i find it so let's let's do this let's let's do this with an amplitude okay in this case our we need a general local lagrangian uh, what we've had so far is not quite sufficient we we keep the same first piece. Um, there'll be a another piece that looks the same form trace that we've seen, u trace u dagger quantity squared. But now its coefficient isn't necessarily the same Thing that we had before, it could be a different coefficient. And as far as the symmetries are concerned, there could be a second one. Trace t mu u, d nu u dagger, trace d mu u, d nu u dagger. So they're basically a different form. These L1 and L2 are some coefficients at this stage they're unknown okay then i i do my loops and 
I'm going to use the, the the results of doing it. Um, copy this one. Okay, so this is what happens if I do the full theory and take the low energy limit. Okay, this is actually a very painful calculation. Um, the reason is that it involves this box diagram. And if you've ever calculated a box diagram, you know that they're incredibly messy. Um, this took, this is, it's, anyhow, that's a painful calculation, but there it is. That's, that's the answer. And the various features you see is you see suppressed terms, um, with power laws, you see, so there's this one over T. So, okay, T is um, P1 minus P3 squared. S is P1 plus P2 squared. And U is P1 minus P4 squared. And this technically is pi zero, pi zero, pi plus, pi plus. Okay, it's a particular calculation. Um, and so you see the leading piece that was calculated, well, that I didn't do the calculation for you, but it was the part that was sitting right there. That's that's the leading piece. And here are some corrections at higher orders. Okay. If I do the effective field theory now, okay, the effective field theory Um, is actually an easier calculation. And the reason it's easier is because I just have to do with that bubble diagram and that's a trivial calculation. Anyone can do that. You don't have to do any box diagrams. Um, you find the same first piece. Well, that's that's what I explained to you already. Was that you get the same first pieces? The uh, you you get divergences. Those divergences are um, ones that weren't there in the in this the full theory calculation, but I've. I've observed the divergences into renormalized parameters, which I can do. And there's the there's the definition. And I then get the following form. Um, you see these parameters that I introduced from the effect of Lagrangians. They give various energy dependences. There's another one right there. And then you also get logarithms. Okay. So what's interesting here is that you can see that it's, they're starting to be similar. They're not exactly identical at this stage. But if I choose
they become identical. If I choose those coefficients properly. So if I choose those coefficients to have a particular form, then I get ex exact agreement. The, the effective field theory calculation becomes the same as the full theory calculation at low energies. Okay, so what I've gotten here is that I've shown that the, the effective field theory is the equivalent of the full theory, even at loop level. I didn't um, get that. Could you try again? I don't know. Um, the effective theory and the, the full theory are equivalent if I choose my parameters these two parameters correctly. So the only effect of the having that full theory has been um, condensed into two two numbers. Okay, so what have we done? The, the key features here is that the low energy degrees of freedom are the Goldstone fields. That's what we've been calling pions here. Um, and we've taken a renormalizable Sigma model and moved it into an unrenormalizable effective field theory with a simple Lagrangian and shown that that gives the same predictions. At low energies, there's you have to there's two numbers that you have to know. The two numbers are the remnant of the full theory. Okay, so. Having done this, what are the predictions? So it's it's a tool. So we've certainly seen how to do this as a tool. What are the predictions? Well, the parameters themselves are not predictions. The, uh, are not predictions of the effect of field theory. They have to be, they're determined by the full theory. So the effect of field theory doesn't predict them, but, but it does predict various things. It does predict the structure of the amplitude. And what's relevant for what we'll, do later is it also produce, predicts the logs. So let's go back and look at the features. The, the structure was given in terms of these Mandelstam variables in various forms. 
where the effective field theory couldn't predict the coefficients because it doesn't know the, the parameters, but it could predict the structure. So that's good. But that's, you know, in some sense that can probably be found from symmetries of the theory in general. But what couldn't be found is these logs. You wouldn't know any, you wouldn't be able to predict the coefficients of these logs except by explicit effective field theory calculations at one loop. Those logs then are, are you clear quantum predictions, one loop predictions of the effective field theory. So the logs are, are the one loop predictions. Um, these are the things that I've highlighted before are non-local. And so you kn we know ahead of time that they can't be the same as these coefficients. So we know without without any work that that there are no coefficients for those logs. Um, no unknown coefficients. Because, because they can't be local, okay? So they have to be, they're not from the local piece. You also then get other reactions. I've done one here. And what I haven't shown you the proof of yet is that these other reactions are all expressible all their, their effects and their logs and everything, whatever their structure is, they use the same two constants. So from what I haven't showed you so far, that's, that's the fact that they're the same is not immediately obvious. But then I've also gotten some other information theory out of this also. The techniques um, hold for other theories. Okay, so for example, if you had the same symmetry you would have the same predictions. But with different L1s, L2s. Okay, so you, you'd have, you'd know that if there's another theory that had the same low energy symmetry, well, you'd get the same predictions, but the co coefficients could be different. And this is actually the case in the real world. QCD has as an approximate symmetry. So this is the theory of chiral symmetry. And those formulas that I showed you apply to QCD if I added some corrections in. So you don't need to know what the high energy theory is to know the structure of the scattering amplitudes. Okay, is there, maybe this is a good place to stop for questions um, because I've, I've gone through a good deal at, in this second example. Any questions? Okay, let's see. Um... There are no questions in the chat, but uh, I don't know if, because I guess that someone at any time can. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um. So my question is about the efficiency of this method. Um. Suppose that the interaction, uh, 
includes uh, more number of parties, then we'll have to go um, via gauge fixing terms and adding ghosts to our calculation, right? But uh, in case of the particles, uh, multiple particles, like more than two, uh, what are we going to do in that case? So more particles? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for uh, for example, in two two interaction, uh, we might get four uh, Feynman diagrams. But uh, if the uh, in in the two three interaction, we might get around uh, 20, 25 diagrams. Then in that case, we'll have to uh, compute for each and every Feynman diagram available, right? So the question, the cap calculation gets complex. Right. So, so the the calculation is 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 always going to be simpler in the effective field theory. So if you had more particles around, you just add more particles to the effective action. Basically, the the rules of the game are that you use in your effective action the low energy degree is the freedom, and you you use the symmetry of the theory. And so you write out the most general Lagrangians involving those symmetries, those degrees of freedom with those symmetries, and then you've got it. If you have a very complicated um, full theory, so if your full theory is very complicated, you perhaps may just want to um, not bother calculating the full theory because the effective field theory is so much easier to, to deal with it's in this case it was um just a simple bubble diagram whereas the full theory's calculation is very complicated it's even worse in more elaborate theories but then you would in order to know those parameters, you'd measure them in some reaction. You'd go off and measure them and use them to predict other things. You would still have predictions being the logarithms, but you'd have to do, use measurements of these to tell you the um, constant terms. Okay, so it's... Okay, got it. And uh, what's the title of your notes or paper that you're using? So... What am I using for these formulas? Yeah. Yeah. So these, the formulas that I'm using and the presentation that I'm doing, are very close to. To the book that I recommended that you download, which is the Dynamics of the Standard Model. Thank you so much. Which right. is by myself. Galovich and Holstein and I wrote the, this the sections that I'm I'm using here so these are that's that's the way I think about the problem got it thank you okay so you can see the formula is developed in, in more detail in that book um and again free so okay any other questions before i move on uh there was a raise then but yeah sorry oh. uh it i think it relates to what with something that you just said but earlier you said maybe that's really obvious for you guys uh, that renormalization uh it's equivalent in some sense to measurements would you yes. Could you explain that, not in the sense of the mathematics, but conceptually what that means? Right. Yes. And so basically what it means is that um, when we have a physical theory, we have these parameters in it. And we don't know those parameters. So we have to go out and measure them in some way. So the electric charge is a good example. Um, the QED doesn't predict the value of the electric charge, and so we go out and you measure it. And to do that, you have to specify a particular process. 
at a particular and really a particular energy scale that you're you're making that measurement at. So in QED, the very typical one is you measure it near Q is equal to zero. And that gives you the standard electric charge. Um, if you do the calculation to, to let's say one loop order, you'll find that 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 the, all those divergences that you find it in the effective field theory, I mean in the full calculation, um, get absorbed into that measured parameter. So the process of renormalization is really the, the process of measuring that parameter and expressing all your answers in terms of the measured parameter. And when you do that, there are no longer any divergences in the theory. And in this particular case, the heavy masses also disappear and all the unknown physics from high energies disappear. Um, does that help answer your question? Yes, kind of, but okay. let's go. So, but <laughs> I think it's an important point. I mean, many of the textbooks and the discussions that you see are concerned about the infinities. And the, the fact that there are infinities is basically irrelevant. Um, those they may not really be infinities. They may be finite numbers that, but it's it's some unknown physics of high energies. We don't know what happens at high energies, and our calculations have them looking divergent. But but really the the issue is the is that I need to express my my um, predictions in terms of measured parameters. And when I do so, those divergences never appear in the answers. Um, so the 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 focus on divergences is is in the end less important than is the fact that you have to measure the parameters. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. I have I have to do so. Let, let me um say a couple more things, and then I I go, I come back to these divergences. Um, I want to mention power counting. We we saw that the ex matrix element that we had there was some something T over V was its leading order term, which T is of order energy squared. It's the four momentum squared. And it was coefficients plus logs at order T squared over V to, v to the fourth. So these are of order energy to the fourth. And what we're seeing here is that there is an energy expansion. That the leading piece is of order energy squared, the corrections were of order energy to the fourth. And you can imagine if you keep going, there's going to be energy to the sixth, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, the, you can pull out the fact that the loops are always going to be of order t squared. Um, and so let's just one loop one loop be of order t squared. Let's just do that without um actually doing the calculation. But basically, if you remember this vertex here was of order energy squared over v squared, this was of order energy squared over v squared. And some of those energies are internal loop momentum energies and some are external. But you can get out of this that this goes like one over V to the fourth times some loop integral, which is a function of the external momentum.
since overall the amplitude is dimensionless, this thing has to come out of order energy to the fourth because I have the one over V to the fourth there already. If I did a two loop calculation, let's try to draw that quickly. This goes like one over V to the sixth, V squared, V squared, V squared. And so this has to, uh, without knowing anything, it comes out of order energy to the sixth. And so there's power counting rules that at order energy squared, you only need only tree level. Order energy to the fourth, you need trees plus one loop. At order energy to the sixth, you need trees plus two loops. And this goes on. This, this is actually also true in gravity. We already saw that at um, that we we did some scalar loops, and we saw that one loop came out of order curvature squared, which is of order energy to the fourth, because there's four derivatives in that. So this is mirrored in the gravity calculation, which we'll talk about Friday. Okay. Okay. The last point I want to address here is renormalization. The Renormalization is not the important physics. In an effective field theory. And the reason it's not is because it is probing the UV parts of the theory and the effective field theory we know gets that wrong. It just isn't the correct UV thing. Uh, description, but it has to be done. And there are two issues that um, that I wanted to highlight in particular. One is, is how do we know that the same renormalization happens for all processes? Okay, what I showed you there was that I took one process and I said I get the same answer if I choose the coefficients in a particular way. I that doesn't prove to you that if I took a different process, I could get this the same result with those same parameters. And the second feature is does does the renormalization preserve the symmetry? Um, so both of those are not yet answered, but the answer to these is to use the background field method. Okay. Um, I... I'm going to reorder what I had planned to do. So there's going to be a little bit of um, reliance 
comments on, on some results that I will try to derive quickly at the end. But let me get the essential point out there out here first. Um, if we do the background field method, we will be able to renormalize all processes. Okay, and I had in an earlier um, lecture talked about the background field method, partially because we want to be able to do that here and with gravity. So what I will do first is I will just give you the result for the linear sigma model. Um, because this is easy to work out and it's, it's a good example. In the case of the sigma model, I'm going to take this U and I'm write it as a background field times some fluctuation, delta over V. Okay, here's the background field. And this is the flux fluctuation. The Lagrangian then as a function of u can be expanded as the Lagrangian of u bar plus L, the first order term of u bar and one power of delta and the second order term u bar and delta plus dot dot dot. This guy vanishes by the equations of motion. First variations are the equations of motion. So if the background field satisfies equations of motion, it vanishes. And then I'm left with a quadratic term. I can write the second order term as, so it's can be written as it's gonna be second order. So these, these things have, it's second order. There's some, they have a carrying index because it's, and so there's a matrix here, AB. It involves two derivatives of these fields in general. And so we, we write this in what's our canonical form, d mu d mu plus some some matrix where d mu is d mu plus some gamma mu, which is a function of u bar. And sigma is some function of u bar. So this is, at this stage, it's mechanical. You, you take the original Lagrangian, just write it in this form, and then you pull out the divergences. Um, I did this by Feynman diagrams before. Um, I had planned to, before making this result, do the heat kernel expansion. But let me just give you the answer, then I'll try to say some words about the heat kernel. The, the, Divergences here, pi squared, one over epsilon. So you get one over epsilon terms, and they are written as trace one twelfth gamma mu nu, nu gamma mu, mu nu plus one half sigma squared, 
where Gamma Mu Nu is the commutator D Mu with D Nu. Okay. So what this does is this then gives you the effect of renormalization as for all these functions as a function of the background field. So you can write out a, a, a Lagrangian for this background field that's fully renormalized, that has all powers of the field in it. Um, let's see if I, I have the answer pulled out over here. Um, copy it. This is actually for a little bit more general theory. This is for QCD. I'll just it. It also applies for our calculation here. Um, the the form that I described to you is there. Um, you should neglect those pieces. You, those aren't appropriate for us, and these are not appropriate for us. But the the linear sigma model then would be just the terms that I wrote there. It just functions of the background field. But what you can see from having done this is it has the symmetry. And it has um, u bar is e to the i tablet pi over v, all powers of the field. And so this implies that you've renormalized all, all processes. Okay, so by doing the background field, you've you've done the renormalization more effective, more efficiently. Okay, let me ask for questions on this piece. There are still no questions in the chat, so probably if someone wants to ask something you can also raise a hand and again on youtube but let's see it's probably not for the moment but okay we, we can okay. i don't know postpone it because okay good well i'm i know that i'm effectively out of time it started five minutes late so i'm gonna st steal five minutes um <laughs> I'm not going to be able to present this totally efficiently. And so I'm going to ask anyone who's interested in seeing this to read Appendix B. of the dynamics of the standard model where I'm I'm now going to just flash you some some slides from there I'll I'll paste them in here after we finish but let's just move to my prepared slides here um the actually I don't have the I don't have everything prepared do I have this thing all right um what I have here The what I have what you see from that portion of the book is we can derive the divergences that I just showed you. Um, I'm not going to be able to have time to do it, but let's um, let's just say what's going on here. The heat kernel itself is 
the matrix element of a e to the e to the minus tau some differential operator. And in our case, this differential operator is going to be our famous d mu d mu plus sigma uh, with d mu equals d mu plus some gamma mu. Okay, so it's a function of the background fields. And the, the properties of this are that it free fields can be expanded and you get just get m squared. Actually, there's an m squared here too. Um, over tau to the d over two, and there's a four pi to the d over two. And you, you get that just by inserting plane wave states here. Um, and then this is the piece that you get. And then in, in an interacting theory, there are corrections to this. These corrections are called the Seeley DeWitt coefficients. And by using properties of uh, of logs, one can get out that the log of this differential operator is then related to the integral, the tau over tau of the heat kernel and is then expressed in terms of okay, plus maybe a, a constant. Okay, so the this little setup. So I've got a differential operator. I I want I know from the path integrals give me the the log of that differential operator, and by using this expansion, the gamma of two minus d over two piece that you see for the divergences comes along with the a two coefficient of x. So if you can calculate the a two coefficient, you've got your divergences of your theory. And then for this, for the calculation of that, I refer you to you. Okay. I wanted to say this because in the gravity case, this is how we calculate many of some of our divergences. Uh, we use this, the heat kernel expansion and the background field method. And we just then look up the A2 coefficient and find out our divergences. Okay, it's an efficient way to do the field theory calculation. Um, um, sorry, can I ask you one thing? Like, what, what are the A0, A1, and uh, okay, other coefficients? A0, A0 is, is one. So here's the physics. Uh, let's forget the formulas for the moment. Um, A0 is just one. Um, A, A1 is... is um, the effect of A1 is basically the tadpole diagram. Um, and so it, it it really is just sigma. I think it's sigma over two. No, it's, it's sigma. A2 is the bubble diagram. So I, I shouldn't make those wiggles. I just make them X's there. There are the interactions there. A2 is the effect of the, the bubble diagram. And it's then the where you find the bubble diagram. So in a massless theory, the tadpole vanishes, and the bubble diagram gives you your divergences of your theory. Um, so 
A2 is being the bubble. And then if you did continue, A3 is the triangle and box, et cetera. Um, but if you're just interested in pulling out the divergences, really you have to just do the bubble diagram. And But when combined with the background field method, you get to do all, all your renormalizations once in a very simple way, just by looking up this coefficient. And um, writing it in terms of the background field. OK, it, that, thank you. This is definitely briefer than I wished to do, but um, that's what I've got for you. Thank you. All right. Uh, and you'll just see that there are a couple of questions in the chat. So let's see. One question says, in general, for procreation or perturbation decrease during the time or not? And if they disappear, it will fade from the equation. This is, I, OK. Probably, I don't know if Sadek is still here. He can also raise the end if he wants to you know, ask the question a little bit better. Or I don't know if you. Yeah, I, I actually did not catch what the question was there. I'm yeah, so that, that's why I was asking if maybe Sadek can raise the end and we can unmute him so that he can ask the question directly. And while we are waiting for him, uh, there's another question, which is, how would the argument of the uncertainty principle of giving a local theory for every particle to be modified for a theory with some natural cutoff as in Planck length or lattice spacing? Yeah, so um, so if there was a, what, what a lattice is a good example. If there was a, um, a lattice spacing, then then uncertainty principle is unchanged. Um, the local effects then are just live on one lattice site. Um, so I, I don't think that the existence of a fundamental length changes that. You, you can't get smaller distances than, than one lattice spacing when you're on a lattice. But if you're in the very low energy limit, you don't see the lattice spacing and so, um, a lot of spacing would have to be taken to be small. Inverse lattice spacing has to be I mean, lattice spacing has to be small compared to the distances that you normally describe. Um, uh, I don't know if that answers the question. It's, bas it's basically is that there's a fundamental length scale you can't get smaller, but still, locality is defined at low energies where low is defined by um, length scales, which are much larger than the fundamental length scale of the theory. All right. So let's see if, okay. Concerning the previous question, let's see if, In the meantime, if there are other question, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. Uh, regarding this renormalization of the effective field theory, right. you are renormalizing re just the the low energy terms, right? That's correct. Or the one loop terms. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, well, I, uh, you know, if you're doing one loop, you do, you do the first two terms in the effect of Lagrange and get renormalized. Oh, the effect of Lagrange gets renormalized. So, so, my question is about the the infinities that appear on this this renormalization that you can absorb on this renormalization. Are they any any way conceptually different? from the infinities that you get in the full theory, the quantum field theory trying to, 
to to get rid of the the full quantum field theory. I mean, in if you try to get a high energy quantum gravity and you you will not be able to renormalize it. How is it different? The, those infinities. I mean, how are they different? Right. So the, they are... yeah. So the, the they are different in a sense. The um the full theory in our case that we had right here was renormalizable, and the the only the two parameters that needed to be renormalized were the the sigma mass and the coupling constant lambda. Um, those are, once you've renormalized those, you have a finite, you make finite predictions. Um, the effect of field theory divergences were different than that. They, they came because the effect of field theory is, is in fact the wrong description at high energies and is in fact more divergent than the full theory was. Um, the full theory is... Even if you had a had a had a finite full theory, the effective field theory is going to be divergent. But it's just because the theory is wrong at high energy. The effective field theory is wrong. Um. So the renormalization program basically uh, is a way of dealing with the fact that it's wrong. You use the fact that the high energy behavior gives you local terms in a Lagrangian. And so those those wrong divergences have to be absorbed into local parameters in the effect of Lagrangian. And so once you do that, uh, that, uh, that um, redefinition of the, of the parameters and you either measure them or determine them from the full theory, you have a, a, a nice finite renormalized theory to deal with. So you've um, you've used the uncertainty principle to say that the divergences are local, and so even if they're wrong, it doesn't matter. They go into these parameters, and that's what we'll do for gravity too. We'll say there are going to be unknown parameters in the general effect of Lagrangian for general relativity. We, in principle, will have to go out and measure them. The full theory may be finite, may not be finite. We don't know. Pretend it's finite. However, the effective field theory definitely has these divergences, but they're local. They can be accounted for by just defining, measuring the parameters at low energies. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. I will say those words again, or maybe maybe in a more coherent fa fashion next time, because that's the 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 goal of the next time is to take these type of techniques and apply them to gravity. And you can see the that they're relevant because the these type of non polynomial interactions are very similar to gravity. All right. Uh, well, I see no further questions. So I guess it's going to end this lecture here. And okay. we'll see each other this Friday. This Friday. So two days. Yes. Yeah, so we'll days. finish up with the predictions, making predictions in general relativity that are reliable predictions of quantum gravity. All right, great. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Good. Thank you, John. Yeah. Bye. See you on Friday. Bye-bye. See you on Friday.